Okay, well, hi, everybody, and welcome, James Corbett, myself, Vinny Caggiano, and we're doing uh, another another uh, installment of uh, the band with Kaleidoscope Ears, probably my the worst name for a playlist I've ever given anything. I should have called it Leave It to the Beatles, like Leave It to Beaver from the era. You know, that would have been good. But no, Kaleidoscope Ears, what? I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Yeah, it was about their way of imagining music, you know. But okay. And anyway. actually, I, let me defend it because honestly, that is one of the great things about the Beatles. Is yeah, they weren't clean, trained classical musicians. They weren't great on their instruments and all that. Blah blah blah. They couldn't read music. Da da da. But they had incredible ears. Yes. They heard yes. things that a lot of people wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, definitely, most definitely. And we love them for it. They're awesome. So, uh, you know, going along the track, we're uh, now we, we uh, were on the Let It Be record and we did two of us. And now we're walking down the long and winding Abbey Road. Uh, their final record, not chronologically, but in reality, their final record. And uh, yeah, and we're looking at. Something. Something. Uh, but first, why don't we talk? Why don't we just kind of discuss the some Abbey Roadness, the the record in general, the feeling of the times, and everything. Um, one thing I do want to mention, which I mentioned before, is that uh, the, 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 there's a new quality of the actual the actual recording quality of the record is very different from many other Beatles records, and that's because they got the new uh, Neve mixing board, which gave it a kind of um, more liquid sound. I can't describe it other than that, but really beautiful tone from that uh, mixing board. Absolutely. So for people who don't know sort of the uh, the Beatles chronology of this, as you say, um, this was not the last album to be released chronologically, but it was the last album to be recorded. Asterisk, I guess they did some cleanup work in on Let It Be in early mm -hmm. 1970, but really this is the last album they went in to work on. And uh, it came out of the Let It Be, the Get Back sessions, as they were known at the time, um, specifically because once they realized in January, oh, you know, this idea we had for recording it and putting out the film and the album and all this, this is not going to happen right now. We're going to have to work on this. We need something else. Let's go right back in and make a new album for this year. So essentially, as soon as they were wrapping up Get Back, they were going back into the studio to start on work on this, essentially. Um, they already had several of the songs that they were kicking around in various forms, so um, that part was solved, and then they came up, of course, with the medley, or which... Which, yeah, again, the Beatles doing something unprecedented yet, unprecedented yet again, you know, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but they were throwing around titles for the record, and one Paul came up with was Everest, and I thought about that, you know, uh, Abbey Road is their crowning glory. I mean, that really is a gem of a record. Like, what a gem that record is. And it's almost as if to say, we reached the peak. You know, we did it. We climbed to the top. And who could dispute it? No, yeah, as I've said before, and I'll continue to say, yeah, probably the best album by the best band of all time. Um, incredible, every time you go back to it. And so many different things. But how about in terms of the... I mean, clearly we're at the end of the 60s. What did that mean in terms of what was going on in society at that time? How was this received at the time? What did it mean, culturally speaking? Yeah, yeah. The Beatles were shy to make political statements. Uh, Lennon started getting into it just as soon as he got out of the band. Uh, in fact, he became kind of obsessed with it. Um, that's why Paul wrote Too Many People. You know, that's, that was the whole stab at John with that song. You know, always telling people what to do and how they should live type of thing, which uh, sounds familiar. You know, um, we have a society that's kind of like you have to live this way and that's it. So it still applies. Um, you know, the interesting thing to me is this album is not psychedelic, but whenever I listen to it, it feels very psychedelic. I, I can't explain why. Um, maybe because when I was a kid, I was tripping a lot uh, when that record came out, so maybe that was it. But uh, there's the psychedelic thing is obviously already on the way down. You know, people now we're getting the power rock bands like Cream and stuff like this. 
And the tumult, the end of the 60s was, was, was so tumultuous. Um, you know, 1968 was hell. And uh, so that was all behind them. But, I, you know, I, I don't think they dared make a political statement at that point. I don't think they wanted to, even slightly. And maybe it's just their sensitivity to their public image or whatever. They've spoken about it. They, they talked about how they kind of didn't want to really mention it. But yes, they were against the Vietnam War type of thing. Well, I mean, John had sort of dipped his toe into that already by that point. But clearly the other members were not, were not yeah, speaking out about that Yeah, revolution was obviously political, yeah. right? Um, now, you're going to... How should I say this? Should I go full on? Let, why don't I just dive head on, on in and uh, offend yeah. you? Uh, when I hear this album, I hear, I hear the way that '70s folk rock, country rock, that kind of stuff, that sound kind of came out of this. Mm -hmm. um, the Beatles and the better, White Album, but mm -hmm. but I, you know, I I hear the beginnings of the '70s in this album actually. Totally. And uh, even to bands like Eagles and what have you. I, I, oh yeah. I mean, they stole the the sort of the sound, and obviously <laughs> are not as good as the Beatles. But I, I hear that in this album. Am I crazy for hearing that? No, not at all. In fact, uh, you know, I was just actually reflecting on that idea today. You know how like um, people talk about the kind of existential idea of when I see the color blue, is it the same experience that you have when you see the color blue? Do you actually see the same thing I see? And I was thinking about that when it comes to the Beatles, because bands like Kiss have attributed them, their big influence was the Beatles. And I'm like, how are you hearing the Beatles, guys? Like, where are you? <laughs> That's what you come up with, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but no. Listen, it's not an insult. I think. Uh, I think. I think you know. Like I think it caused the lesser artists and the greater artists to to expand. You know, it it just opened up everything. That and the White Album, Abbey Road and the White Album. The White Album is responsible for progressive rock, which is really horrifying to me. You know. Uh, from the lower end of the spectrum, like Foreigner, bands like that, who did all these arrangey things with their music. And then you, you go up to the higher part of the spectrum, like King Crimson, Crimson who was, which was a remarkable band full of musicians. And, you know, but it was definitely this kind of, OK, let's do seven for a time and let's modulate here. Where's the role in the rock now? It's gone. That's what Joni Mitchell once said. You know, I love rock and roll, but it still had the role. It became rock. So, uh, yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that set the stage for the 70s. The Beatles said, with the White Album and Abbey Road, they said, you can do all of this. They, they pretty much gave the menu out to musicians, and then musicians cherry-picked what they like and did it. Yeah, that's where you get your James Taylors and John Denvers and your, you know, progressive rock guys and folkies and the whole bit, the whole bit. But then on the other, you know, you also get high-level stuff like... I doubt, I think Steely Dan, I don't think they owe a lot to the Beatles. They wouldn't ever come out and say that. But I do think that if it wasn't for, for Abbey Road and stuff like that, bands wouldn't be thinking in that way, you know. They'd still be writing basic love songs and things like this. Yeah. Well, anyway, the things that always stick out to me about this album are the harmonies and the bass. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no. Um, I was... Uh, I think I've told you this anecdote before. I, I would one night with my friend Nancy, we laid down, smoked a little of the herbal jazz cigarettes, and uh, uh, listened to Revolver, Peppers, and Abbey Road in a row, just laying down there, and it was so blissful. When we got to Abbey Road, I'm all I was listening to at one point was Paul, like this bass. The bass is even in in the song something. It is so amazing. Amazing. And uh, for anyone who's interested, there is on GooTube, unfortunately, but there is Abbey Road, but it's just Paul, and it's literally just the bass isolated for the entire album. So it's yeah, I've heard that wanna, one. <laughs> if you want to get into it, you can get into it. Yeah, now, now I will say now we're kind of easing into the song something here. Um, I will say that some critics did actually put Paul down for being too. If you listen to it, it sounds like he had a bit too much coffee. He's just. He's doing a lot of like, he'll play a single note, but he'll play it three times. Yeah. Do, 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 you know, yeah, that yeah, sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. It sounds yeah. like he's a little antsy, but he's also, 
using it as a playground to just do his brilliant Paul thing, you know, it, it, those bass parts are insanely great. And, you know, the beauty of it is, like, when you look at, we'll talk about the guitar solo later, but when you look at the bass, you look at the guitar solo, and then you compare that to bands like King Crimson, where everybody's a frickin' virtuoso musician, uh, they were slow hands. You know, Paul McCartney wasn't doing anything so impossible to physically do on the bass, but the choices, the melodic choices are just, man, like he just is a melody machine. It just comes out of him, you know? So, and the guitar solo to something was touted as, as one of his, George's greatest solos. And it's a very slow, deliberate solo. So yeah, something, man. Um, what do you think of the title of the song? It leaves something to be desired. <laughs> oh, really? I love it. Really? I really love it. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, well, I mean, it's appropriate and it's memorable and it corresponds to the main lyrics, so I guess it's good in that sense, but... Eh. <laughs> well, again, you know, we've talked about... Yeah, I get what you're saying. We talked about, like, the difficulty of writing a great love song, you know? And to me, something... the the There's something in the way she moves, you know, the lyrics... And we'll, I guess we'll talk about the lyrics for a bit, but uh, it, it reminds me of the French saying that je ne sais quoi, that, that I don't know what, mm. something, you know? Yeah. And that's what he's trying to express in that yeah. this song. Yeah, like, I guess it does work in that sense. It's just as a word, just as a one word title, it's just the most blandest, boring word. It's not the kind of thing you're looking at the back of the LP and you're like, oh, something, I want to hear that. <laughs> you know? It's kind of like if Paul called here, there, and everywhere here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what it should have been called? Pomegranate. Right. Um, well, that's kind of an in joke now. So now you're going to have to talk about why it should I'm, be called Pomegranate. I'm betting some of, if there's anyone who's listening to this series, they probably know. But anyway, yeah, uh, one of the working lyrics when George was still working on it was. Something in the way she moves attracts me like a pomegranate because he just didn't know what to say. <laughs> All right. So uh, before we get into the lyrics and, and I have a, just a few things to say about it, let's talk about some of the the lore. Like I do know that um, something, as you know, something was the most re widely recorded Beatles song, save for yesterday. And among the artists that 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 did something, who do we have? <laughs> uh, well, Frank Sinatra, as both you and I noted. Let's hold it right there. <laughs> Stick around, Jack. It may show. <laughs> I don't know. I do not know. <laughs> All right, just for the record, he doesn't do the do not, no, but he definitely but does the Jack. He should have, actually. It's very He should have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, yeah, that's one of the, uh, something that stuck out for me from the anthology was when, I think Paul's on the boat and he's talking um, and he says, uh, Frank Sinatra called it the best Lennon-McCartney song. <laughs> it's like, Famous thanks, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> um, who else? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. James Brown, apparently. That was apparently one of George's favorite renditions. Apparently, uh, he said that the vocal performance on that was incredible and he had it on his own jukebox. Um who else? Um, uh, Ray Elvis. Charles. Ray Charles. And by the way, I, I don't know if you, you ran into this little bit of trivia, but apparently Ray Charles was the inspiration for him writing this song. Yeah. Ray Charles inspired it. Yeah, I think, and, I, I, think know, I read that somewhere before. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I have the Coles well, notes yeah. here, guys. <laughs> The thing about Ray Charles is he could do a tender ballad, you know. Um, and by the way, I want to link, uh, you know, first of all, thumbs up and um, shout out to Matt Williamson, w Williamson of Pop Go the 60s. We've been kind of in contact lately. And um, he I, I was just kind of rummaging through his channel and I ran into this um, version of Elvis doing something, but it was in the studio rehearsing it, you know, and it was just remarkable to watch this i don't know where you dug this up matt but it was pretty awesome to watch this and i'll link i'm gonna link, set a bunch of links to different artists who covered it, especially frank because you gotta hear the jack i mean you just gotta hear the jack <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Anyway, it's been covered a lot. Yes. Uh, listed as one of the 500 greatest songs of all time by Rolling Stone magazine. So here's actually here's my experience with this song. I, so I, I like I saw that in the anthology. Everyone said, "Oh, this is one of the greatest love songs." Frank Sinatra said it's great, and all this stuff. And and I was just like, "Really? It's just a boring, silly love song." Like I never got I never got this song until relatively recently, the last few years. And then I started listening to it, and I was listening to Paul's bass stuff, and like I, I it grew on me. And suddenly now I'm like, "Oh yeah, it is a beautiful song." But it took me a while to get there. I guess I just heard a oh, it's a it's a love song, man. Yeah, schmaltzy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you know what? We were talking about cue-ups on that, uh, the version of something I sent you. Uh, you know, we might want to go to the section, we won't do it right now, but uh, the section, you can look for it when the time comes, but the section, um, uh, because there's something I want to mention about the bass there. Mm. Um, okay. When we get into the meat and potatoes of it. But I'll tell you everything I know musically about this comes from a Signals Music Studio um, video. He's uh, a YouTuber that does really, I think, quite good breakdowns. And he had, analyzing the chords from George Harrison, something Perfect Progressions number two. Yeah, this is part of his Perfect Progression series because he, he thought this was a perfect chord progression. I think you mm -hmm. might have something to say about that. But... <laughs> Only about, only about the modulation. <laughs> it's a great chord progression. There's no, as I mean, it's not. There's nothing surprising about the chord progression except for the modulation, mm, actually. Yeah. Uh, and we'll get into that. We'll get into that. Uh, this was uh, John's favorite song on Abbey Road, which is surprising to hear. It's such a tender love song, but he thought it was the best one. And uh, oh, by the way, I mean a lot of people also um, assumed that it was written for Patty Harrison. And I'm sure when she heard George's later quote about it, she wasn't totally thrilled because he, he denied it was about Patty. And, uh, you know, he kind of leaned toward it. it was more about God. Right. And he said, well, when you look at a, a, when you love a woman, it's the it's God that you see in her eyes. And I get that. That's called Tantra. That's called uh, sexy spirituality, kind of, you know. Uh, and I get that. I've had that experience before where I was kind of lifted spiritually because of a woman's energy and just the commingling. I won't go into details. <laughs> is, that, is that why you say, oh, God, I'm coming? <laughs> <laughs> Who is the comedian that said, you know, when lovers are doing it, they're saying, oh, God, oh, baby, oh, God, oh, baby. No wonder why people are having babies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know, I've got this little bit from a reviewer. I just had to write it down because it's just such a funny phrase. He goes, something is a real quality hunk of pop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's I, I don't think of something as a hunk of pop. But yeah. Yeah, I would never put those words together in my life, but that's an interesting <laughs> phrase. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So anything... Uh, Anything you'd like to touch on before we get into the more I think, detailed... well, let's get into the music. All right, let's talk first, though, about the lyrics. There's just a few points I want to make. First of all, I think this song is, although it's romantic, it's also kind of sexy. I, I find the song like a woman would find this sexy because it's almost like whispering in someone's ear. And even the way he enunciates woos me, yeah, right. woos me, yeah, yeah. which, by the way, gets echoed in the guitar solo, that little sine mm. wave, woo, 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 right? Yeah. Um, a few, like, George-esque rhymes in there. Like, the one that caught my ear was, um, uh, where is it? Where is it? Uh, uh, I don't want to leave her now, you know, I believe and how. That's very George, that little and how. He was a little more awkward with lyrics than John was, Yeah, you know? Yeah, that always but, struck me as a bit awkward. I mean, I get it, but... Yeah, yeah. I think John would have completely gotten rid of now and put something else there so he could find a more fitting ending to the phrase. But uh, yeah, very George. You know, we've talked about before how there's a similar similarity between john and george in ways you know and i th i thought about it i thought in terms of taste buds like i would describe john as being bitter 
George is being sour. Yeah. He even wrote a song called Sour yeah, Milk yeah, Sea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Paul is sweet. Yeah. Yeah. And for the life of me, I couldn't come up with any taste for Ringo. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to think of him. Salty? Well, Ringo means Ringo means apple in Japanese. So whatever ah, so flavor that is. <laughs> Tart. But yeah, that's... Uh... Oh, yeah. You know, I, I want to... Just a little quick anecdote. When I was on Facebook, I was in I was in a Beatles blue group, but uh, a forum. But then it got all political and annoying, and I left. Um, and and also the Picayune people who, if you don't say something just right, it's like no, no, John, put the word the in there. Okay, whatever, you know. Um, it got annoying. But uh, when I was in this group, um, I started a thread, and it was it was be- really popular thread. I, I it was entitled sexual innuendos of the Beatles, right? And you could go back to I Want to Hold Your Hand all the way on out to the very end of the band. And there are all these little sexual innuendos. But somebody, some commenter wrote, I think on the Beatles Bible, like in the comment section, somebody wrote, something in the things she shows me sounds a little suggestive. Like, I don't know, right? Did she flash her boobs? Right, I don't know. Right, right, right. Well, I get it if you're thinking that way. Sure. I, I don't think George had that. I in doubt mind. it, but I get the idea. Wait till you find out what "Please Please Me" was really about. <laughs> now, let's talk about the music itself, okay? So, um, one thing: this song is all about lines, lines everywhere, okay? Um, you hear it right away. Now, I used to call, I'm changing my terminology, I used to talk about covert and overt lines. Now I like to call them interior and exterior. You know, the, the exterior lines are the ones that are really obvious. Um, and the interior ones are kind of embedded inside the, the chord progression. And we have sets of both in this. And some that kind of straddle in between the two. So the chord progression, uh, of course it starts... And that's so that's an F da, 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 E flat da, G C very nice the E flat where's that come from okay so we do the parallel relative switch and that's where it comes from and I want to I'm probably going to have to review this a little bit again. But th- this idea, because there's a reason why, and it has to do with the modulation later on, okay? But the parallel relative switch, so parallel means whatever is your, your source chord of the key, your, your root chord C, when all you do is switch it to C minor. And then you ask yourself, okay, what is C minor, the relative minor or sixth step of the key? Of. It's the sixth step of the key of E flat major. So we have the root chord E flat coming in. And um, so that's how we get that. And what it does is it creates a chromatic line. So already we're beginning with a line. Right? Here's a question from you as a composer standpoint. Do you think George probably heard that line and then found the chords you know that's a great question and in this case i don't have any evidence that would tell me one way or the other um yeah that'd be that's a real that's a great question and it's a real curiosity i have no idea i mean i maybe my guess is that he came up with the lick he he liked the sound of it you know And thought, okay, what chords can I find to fit that? And if it, he did it that way, he must have been pretty proud of himself because um, it's nice. You know, uh, Paul, John, George, they always talk about finding the chords. You know, they come up with the melody and they find the chords for it, you know. <clears throat> oh, by the way, just a side note. 
I can't, I, that happened to me the other night. I actually had a little melody, and I had to find the chords for it. I almost started writing a song, but then I just got lazy. <laughs> oh, you're depriving the universe, career. Vinny. Come on, you got to finish it. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those things, you know, the melody ran through my head. That's, an, that's a nice little fragment. I bet I can, you know, kind of elaborate on it and i did i came up with a one six four five like a 50s kind of <laughs> not my, not the hated one. Oh, no, oh, oh sorry <laughs> that's one five uh, six four that, how could i the... possibly confuse those sorry <laughs> no this is the the doo-wop yeah the doo-wop all right so uh the chords are c c major seven C7, F, a little diatonic line, D7, G, and that's kind of a, that is, it's a little passing note, comes kind of ish out of the blues. Yeah. Right? Right. And, um, and he just steps up to the A minor chord. And uh, we have this, A minor, A minor major 7, A minor 7, D9, R lick, E flat, G, C. So uh, prior to the E flat, G was an F chord. Uh, for the lick, the lick is F, E flat, G, C. All right, so uh, talking about that, I wonder if I should, uh, no, I won't do it, but uh, I have a little chart here somewhere or the other, and I want to show you guys the lines in this from a music theory perspective. Lines, lines, and more lines. So what I have here are the C, the C major 7, the C7, and the F. That's about the extent of where that, that line happens. So we have... You can see right off the bat, we're going down in half steps chromatically. C to B, B, which is, and then B flat, and then A. So the C is the root of the C chord. The B is the major seven note. The B flat is the flatted seventh note of C7. And then we land on the A note, which is the, the um, third of F. Now, this is not terribly, um, it's nothing new. It's been done before. Oh, yeah. And in Beach fact, Boys, you know, Kokomo line... starts uh, C, C major 7, G minor, F, which is the same line, just slightly different chords. Yeah, 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 absolutely, same line. And in fact, some, some composers who know what they're doing might ah, go yeah. all the way down. So it, it would be something like C, C major 7, C7, F. F minor, C, and then you get, all right, uh, now when we go to the A minor, uh, <clears throat> now there are two ways to note this, I, I gave it the more kind of uh, quantum physics-y calculus notation. <laughs> which is A minor, A minor, major 7, A minor 7, and then D9. Now, the way they do it, like a jazz chart would say A minor over A, A minor over G sharp, A minor over G, and A minor. Uh, uh, that, the D9, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. It's, it's actually A minor 6 would be very, very, very almost a D9, okay? So... Uh, and here we also have chromatic half-step descent, the same as the first one. So um, now, so if I were to take an A minor chord, let's talk about that, right? If I were to take an A minor chord, I have the full chord here. That's all the notes of A minor. Now I'm going to add another A here, but keep moving it down. Sounds like Michelle right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, 
so basically at that last chord they put a D9. All right, which actually I, I do kind of like, but it could have easily been an A minor uh, six. Yeah, but there's something to that D9. Yeah, the, the D kind of opens up the chord a yeah. little bit more, you yeah. know. I, I like it, yeah. yeah. And it, it's kind of acting like it's a, a very slow extended 2-5. Right? Mm, right, yeah. 2-5 to the G chord. So D9, which is actually a fancy D7, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would resolve to G. Yeah. yeah. Secondary dominant land. Right? Uh now, so um, after this, we oh, oh, let's just go right to the bridge, and then I'll talk about the bone I have to pick with the, the modulation thing. And I'm, I'm prepared for people to throw eggs and tomatoes at me for this, okay? <laughs> so it's all good. Um, so the f first time we hear the lick, it resolves on the C note to bring us back to the, the next verse. Something in a smile that shows. Da -da 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 -da. So... Something right, so there's that. But now we have to get to the key of A, right? And unfortunately, that A chord has not a C but a C sharp in it, and so you get this line. Which bothers the hell out of me. Before I say anything else, this song is absolutely gorgeous, perfect piece of music. Don't get me wrong. It's just that he had two full measures to get to that A chord in, in a more graceful way, honestly. All right. And we'll get to that in a second, but let's look at, at part two of this chart of mine. Um, the lines in this section. Well, well first I'll play it. Um, all right. Um, so we have... Um, into the solo right there all right so there's a bunch of lines here um, first of all we have to we have to distinguish between diatonic lines which are do re mi fa sol la ti do scale steps and chromatic lines which is do do sharp re re sharp mi like adjacent notes in a row either ascending or descending so when we do this section our chords are a a major seven f sharp minor F sharp minor seven to D. And that's where the line ends, so I'm gonna hold it there. What we get is this. And you could hear do T la uh, do T la so mi re do like that. This it's descending down the scale. So that's interior. Pardon me? That's interior? It, that's it, what an what? interior line or an exterior line that's interior yeah that's okay. interior but when we get to yeah <laughs> that's, that's that's the one i definitely hear so yeah all right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so then it goes to, uh, so we, th this is our way this is all chords from the key of a a major seven f sharp minor seven now we get into this um, mixolydian, we, we've been bumping into this where you mix the two type of modalities together. Um, the key of A major has a G sharp, but this chord G comes in, which doesn't belong to the key of A at all, but it does belong to the key of D. And when you root on the A chord in the key of D, you get a scale that sounds like this, rather than... So that G chord is coming from the Mixolydian scale. And he just takes it back up to the A. Which I think that chord, in the Mixolydian world, that chord is what takes you back to the root anyway. All right, so, and we get to that A, and then we get this. All right, and that 
that is obviously an overt line. It's chromatic. A, G sharp, G, F sharp, F, E. And now I'll call up my chart on that. All right, so we're looking at the A, A major seven, F sharp minor, F sharp minor seven, D. This is embedded, this line is embedded within these chords, but these are scale steps. Right here is the A major scale. And I'm pointing the arrow in this direction, say we're going do, ti, la, sol, fa. We're going down the scales. A, G sharp, F sharp, E, D, all right? So that's embedded within the, uh, the chord progression. When we get to the G, it breaks up again. It says here, then G, and then to the, our chromatic line. All right, now, before I go to the chromatic line, I just want to mention real quick the components. <clears throat> this A note is the root of the A chord, this G sharp is the major seven note of the A chord. This F sharp is the root of the F sharp minor chord. The E is the flat seven of F sharp minor, and the D is the root of the D chord. So that's the components of the chords that this line falls on. All right, now we have the intense chromatic line, and you notice there's no chord movement here. It's just A, right? And against that A, we get this very intense chromatic line. And uh, a few of these chords are not ones you'd want to sit on all day, like the F, the sharp five against the A. That's a little intense. I mean, I know jazz guys that use that in a certain context, and it's fine. But you can't sit there going, you know, that's not your pop song of the day. No. And so. it's interesting from a compositional standpoint to note that this, this line definitely was absolutely embedded in this song from the beginning. And um, if you listen to the demo, the acoustic demo, I think on the anthology as well as on the Abbey Road deluxe set, um, there's two Are we different... there from the start? Yeah. Um, and, and so when uh, oh. George is playing just by himself acoustic demo and he gets to that part, he just leaves that in and actually does it with his mouth. Just a doom, 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 doom. And then he's he playing. He, oh, cool. He's not even playing it on the guitar. He's just, but it's definitely, he's leaving the space for that because he knows that's part of it. Well, when I get out of this uh, uh, screen share, I'll show you how it's done on guitar. It's not easy. It, it's not easy to really do. I, I, I understand why he sang it, you know. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so there's that. And uh, then we, I neglected to go to the C chord earlier, but we repeat this whole section again. And then we go here. And uh, so, the sick around jacket may show. I'm going to start from the high octave because the guitar doesn't go that low. The bass could, but my guitar can't. So we got scale steps, diatonic, do, ti, la, sol, but then we jump. So this is the line, C, B, A, G, E, D, C, right? So this, this part is strictly a diatonic line. To tell you the truth, there's no real such thing as a pentatonic line, but they needed... If they stuck the F in there, it would be too many notes to get back to the C. They didn't have, they couldn't do that. So they jumped from G to E and left out the F, which is a pen. This is a pentatonic scheme, at least from here to here. Suddenly, I'm kind like, of forgetting the song. That's the in the bass, or is that in the the guitar? Um. Mm. I think it's I think it's in the bass and um, I think it's also maybe reflected somewhere in the keyboard. Oddly enough, John played piano on this and Billy uh, John Preston played piano. They wiped over that. I think there's Billy Preston organ and I think that's what okay. we're getting on that. Um, that's good. I thought I was going further, Death, because I could not hear the piano. I kept stringing. Yeah, no, they they wiped they dubbed over it with some percussion. Yeah. Um, maybe we should listen to the uh, the cover version just for this bit. Let's listen to that section in the cover version. Sure. So for people's benefit, this is from a pretty brand new cover that was posted up just this month um, to Thomas Brand's channel. It's the Beatles something cover by Hannes Lukas, Teresa, Franziska, and Thomas. 
And it's worth checking out in its, in its entirety. I'm sure you'll include the link. Um, I hope people do. It's I a will, good cover. Yeah, it's a really nice um, rendition. All right, so let's just listen to that, that bit here. You're asking me when my love You know what? I think I'd have to listen to the Beatles, but I think that there's also a piano yeah, doing that. In this one they're they're using the piano there. As well yeah. as an organ, I think. I yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Martin might have left in John's piano part and that's Yeah, and now because... I can't hear it in my head. I've listened to the song a million times. But what did the Beatles right. do? Yeah. <laughs> and and now now the people who love this song will be really angry at us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, you know, I, I should have thought to make a chart about this, but I want to talk about the C to A movement, the key movement. In a real parallel uh, relative switch, it would be the overriding umbrella key would be the key of A major, not the key of C major. But C is the source key of this. It's obviously where we're going home to, and he goes to A. Now, I just realized something today, that when you use the term parallel relative switch, that is, I'm going to say, right, right in the sense of it follows, it, it was born and raised from the blues principle, okay, where you do the relative parallel switch, the reverse order of it, then you just get a modulation, okay, and I, I won't say it's wrong, it's just not raised from the blues, that particular motion, okay, but I do, I do have a qualm with the suddenness of, and the awkwardness even of the melody to go. It really, really bothers me. Like it, like um, two, three, four. You have all that time to figure out how to get to an A chord. So here's, I, I concocted something that would be to me a less water in your face way to get to the A chord. And people are just going to shoot me for this, but it's going to be, <laughs> this is what I would have done. I would have said to George, you should do this. Go back to the C. You're asking me where my love goes. To me, that's just more elegant. I'm sorry. However, with that said, and I'm ducking, I'm ducking. <laughs> With that said, I remember listening to it today and listening to the ending, and I thought, wow, you know what? It's really cool at the ending when, see, right? Yeah. When, when it. Yeah. So it sets up the tension and then relaxes the tension, and I do like that. Now, here's the other thing about the ending that I like. This song is merely A, A, B, A form. We got two verses. We got the bridge. The next verse is a solo, right, based on the verse chords. Then we have a vocal based on the verse chords. So normally in songwriting, you get A, A, B, A, A, B, something like that maybe, right? But what he does is when we're done with that second A, he makes you think we're about to do that bridge again. You'd think it would go into that, but he fakes you out, keeps the song simple and concise, and repeats the lick and ends on C. So I do like that. I do mm. like that very much. Could you but, could you um, combine? Do you think it would work if you combined like yours in that middle bit going into the bridge, but then his at the end? You know, if you didn't have the constant mm. statement of that lick, it would probably yeah. throw you off. Yeah. You know, good point. And you know, one one person mentioned online, I forget who it was, uh, uh, but a music analyst uh, guy said that he thought the actual chorus of the song was the lick itself. Because what you have here, you have no chorus. You have a verse that is a chorus, right? Because what does the chorus usually house? The title of the song. Well, that's in the verse, right? Something in the way, something and something, right? Um, and that's always a problem in you know, naming sections of music is what's the verse, what's the chorus. It's, it's always a little vague, but I would see this as uh, a verse with the embedded chorus and a bridge. That's the way I see it, you know. 
But you one guy suggested that the actual chorus was the lick itself because it introduces everything mm. versus end choruses. I, so, you know, I actually, I kind of get that, yeah. I've yeah, never thought yeah. about it, actually. And if I'm thinking about this song, yeah, what is the chorus? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, um, <clears throat> I just want to talk about this parallel relative switch versus the relative parallel switch. Uh, just real quick. Um, what happens if this was a real parallel relative switch? I'd go. I'm in my master key is C. I turn it to C minor, and I it would bring me to chords from the key of E flat, and then I'd mix the two keys together, E flat and C, and I'd get a beautiful resolution. So I'm just going to mess around with the key of E flat. blossoms and opens up it gets really big but when you reverse it now what I'm going to do is the relative parallel switch I'm going to take C what is wait well, how do you do that uh, C <laughs> C to A minor well you'd have to go to yeah. A minor and then what's a major, relative right? Yeah. right and then you switch A ma- minor to A major then you get those two keys wow James you're one step ahead of me I better to brush up on my music theory here. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem, uh, I won't go into the details, but I, one of these days I want to do like redo my music theory videos and do like really concise, more concise bits of each little piece of theory that I'm into. But I'd like to talk about this one. Like you talk, uh, um, there are songs that do the relative parallel verse rather than the parallel relative. For example, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, the master key is G, and they switch to E. They use right. They use chords from E, um, which is the reverse. It should be E is the master key, and use chords from G. That would be the blues principle. But again, how could you? You know, I once mentioned this to a student, and he goes, "Yeah, but sitting on the dock of the bay is an awesome song." And I'm going, "Yeah, you're right. It is. It, it's so evocative." So yeah, it's not I right or wrong. About? Yeah, right. It's not right or wrong. It's just different way, a different way of modulating. But there is something very pleasing about the real parallel relative switch that I like, and it blows my mind that it comes out of the blues. That yeah, that and to me, it's such it's so iconic of the the kind of rock sound. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting. Like if you take the Who, uh, see me, feel me. And, and the funny thing was, like, the, the, the two keys you're missing between are C and E flat, where E flat is the minor, the, I have to think of a term for this, it's the major key acting as minor to the key of C. And uh, they don't go to the key of C, they build up on the G and go back to F, which is great because the song just keeps building and building and building. You never get back to that, ah, okay, you know, release me. <laughs> So yeah, there's. Uh, I, I think um, if I were still writing my book, I'd write extensively about parallel relative versus relative parallel. And just know. for the benefit of the general audience out there, that is your terminology. Does anyone else talk about That's, that? I I heard of somebody. They don't didn't use my terminology, but I heard uh, one music theorist kind of moving in that direction. Um, I'm sure there's some guys that, that have picked up on this. But I don't think they have, honestly, without sounding like I'm, well, maybe it'll sound like I'm pitching, putting badges on myself. But I really think that the extent that I went through to dig this up out of the blues is, I don't think anybody's done that before. And I'm really, really proud of my discovery. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, ba- a badge. There you go. I'll pin it on you. <laughs> All right. I pass. <laughs> right. Now I could fly without taking a vaccine. Is that right? Oh, this is... This is a backstage pass for my band. Ooh. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, we'll see. Maybe I'll come to Japan. We'll see how I'm not goes. promising anything, Vinny. All right, now let's just talk real quick about the. Um... Oh, let's let's. Can you cue up the? And I want I want everybody to focus on the bass what the bass is doing, because I think he replicates it, right? Uh, let's, let's find out. 
bass player and I'm, even Paul might have done this when he was younger would have gone right but he hits the root and then which the melody alone that fragment is a great little melodic fragment it's just amazing I, I recommend anybody to really really when you listen to this song listen to Paul listen to what he's doing on the bass I mean yeah it's He's close to being over the top, but it, I don't think he really takes it too far. Um, yeah, uh, the drums are also worth mentioning. Ringo's work on this is just fantastic work. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah, I was actually just listening to this this morning and, and just noticing some of the, the things he was doing. Like, oh, yeah, no, good props to Ringo. There's a tremendous amount of energy in this song if if not from john from the rest of the guys they're really putting their all into this you can hear it i think ringo i think what happened was paul got into his really cool bass parts and ringo's picking up on that and going wow that's cool you know i'm gonna play off of that and uh because really you know if it didn't have all these elements all these real ear tickling cool little elements it might be slightly boring you yeah, know i think that might be it i think that's why i didn't really get it for a long time yeah. is that I wasn't picking up on those elements. I was just kind of listening to the main, I mean, not that the main yep. melody is bad, but it's just, yeah, it could be, it could be schmaltzy if it wasn't so interesting. Yeah. 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 I, I think uh, they do a great job. I, 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 I wish I was a fly on the wall when I saw them developing this. Oh God, do I wish, I mean, if there's any record I want, I would want to be a fly on the wall for it's this or revolver, mm. you know, well, you can this, get a bit of that uh, apparently with the Nagra reels from January '69 when they were working on this and other songs. Yeah, get a bit I have of to. It. Do you have? Uh, do you, Do you have that like in your library? Do you... No. no. Um, I it... was just talking to the uh, Anthony Rotino from the Glass Onion podcast, and he was talking about how uh, it was appearing online for a little while last year, and he oh, was downloading oh. it, but Apple quickly made sure that that might be on the torrents though somebody might be sharing it on the torrents it's nagra n-a-g-r-a i don't know i don't know how to spell that anyway but someone uh, some kind person in the stupid. comments will fill us in yeah maybe so some kind please do be that kind maybe your friend well, uh, clearly that's what uh, matt williamson is playing in his uh pop goes the 60s videos where he's showing ooh, the conversations yeah. and stuff okay yeah. wink wink no judge there matt <laughs> <laughs> help a brother out <laughs> anyway <laughs> all right so uh i think i covered all the music theory as best as i can um i just again i just have to say again that paul's avoiding that cliche and coming up with that gorgeous line is just it's freaking magnificent man yeah. it, it's magnificent. I, I, I did you say this? Who said this recently? Oh, I was just listening to a podcast that was just talking about this. But the best best explanation I've heard for it is, yeah, okay. People sometimes say John was a bit lazy. I mean, clearly, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was yeah. a bit lazy. And even really that right. translated even to some of his chord movements and things. He did things a bit lazily that worked because he was a genius, but kind of lazy. But Paul, the yin to the yang, he was the energy. And yeah. I think that's it. There's this restless energy to him. It's like, da, 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 and that's boring. Let's what what can we do here? Da, 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 da. Like yeah, he just what's had that new? Energy. What's a bright idea? Yeah. You know, like that's Paul. Like, w w give me give me something new. Give me something. And especially now, I mean, my God, you know, he had a lot of that energy. I still think the Ram album is comparable to work that Mozart did. I think that record is just unbelievably good. He still had a lot of that energy. I mean, that's me. That's my taste. I'm not a big fan of post Beatles Beatles, but I love John's first record and Imagine. I love George. Um, let's yeah, George's songwriting. I have to hit on that for a second. Um, you know, under the the shadow of the giants, John and Paul, he had to really really sweat to come up with a song that they would say okay we'll do that one you know 
So thing... it, this is sorry to cut you off, but this is the reason I chose this song in particular. And I know you said you thought I was going to choose something, and it turned out you were thinking of something else. I'd be interested to hear what you think I was going to choose. I chose this specifically because I wanted to give some love to George. And so we did Within You, Without You on, off of Sgt. Pepper. We were doing something off of this album. And I, I say that because this album, clearly, George deserved to be on this album alongside John and Paul, which is Whoa. the greatest thing you could say about any songwriter ever. Yeah. I think George Martin said, you know, I realized that, that George came into his own as a great songwriter when I heard Here Comes the Sun. But then when I heard something, I realized... This is this is iconic, you know, this song. And it is iconic. It's it's truly great. Um, I, I, you know, George, you know, I use the word sour for George. He, um, he always liked these strange little seventh chords popping on these odd little notes that, you know, like if you think of uh, I Want to Tell You, you know, uh, 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 does that, you know, that whole bit. That's very George. He just likes this odd stuff. <clears throat> I I have to be honest. I love his early work. I, I'm happy just to dance with you. I'm I'm great with. I, I love. Uh, uh, I need you. I love. Um, uh, I I adore. Uh, think for yourself. I think that's great. And it's all part of that whole vibe of that time too. That, you know, just it felt right for that period what they were doing. Uh, so I don't have any qualms with George's writing, but I can imagine how intimidating it was to, to you know, hey, guys, I, I got this. Or from the reverse perspective, which we don't have, obviously, but having grown up with John and Paul and having been in the room with them and having seen their process and everything, he didn't have the mystique of this is John Lennon and Paul McCartney. He had these are my friends. Like, yeah, I deserve right. to be here. I'm, you know, I'm just one of them. I'm one of the gang. He didn't right, have this right. ma massive thing built up that we do coming from our perspective. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. And I think he learned a lot from watching them head to head, you know, um, working on songs. Yeah, yeah. But I think, too, we mentioned before that there was a certain bitterness that he had about... Um, I think he was jealous. I think there's a bit of sour grapes there. I think he was jealous that they were so great. Um you know, when he talked about the hits and he said it so cynically, yeah, but George, you try to write the hits, okay? Well, he got yeah. one here anyway. <laughs> got a couple on this album. Yeah. Now, you know, one thing I'll say is that I don't like, I'm not, like, if I look at All Things Must Pass, it's got a vibe. Didn't Phil Spector produce that? I think, Do you know? I think you're right. I don't know off the top of my head. I think mm -hmm. he's the perfect producer for this because it's got, it's very sparkly and spiritual and big and horns and choruses and wall of sounds, Phil, Phil Spector, you know? But I think it's perfect for that whole Krishna thing and, you know, just getting the spiritual vibe out there. But actually, when I break down his chord movement for a lot of songs, some of the songs are kind of like, what were you thinking? Why did you make that chord movement there? It doesn't make sense, you know. I didn't like a lot of his writing post-Beatles. And uh, there is one song off that record, though, that I absolutely adore, and it's called Wawa. And uh, only because he uses a Lydian flat 7 chord at one point, and I just love Lydian flat 7, and he exploits the Lydian sound with the vocals going, Wawa, and it's the Lydian note. It's... Killer cool. George had this thing about suddenly coming up with something absolutely brilliant out of nowhere. You know, um, so, you know, you go to the White Album while my guitar gently weeps. You know, that's that's iconic, that song. All right. I always forget about that because I don't like it that much. But <laughs> other people like yeah. that song, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, you got to listen to it in a certain way. Um, you know, first of all, the work of Eric Clapton on that is just spine tingling. It's just really like wow man you were right on it for that one and uh, the way mccartney kind of echo like imitates george in the harmonies it's really cool there's some cool bits about that song i mean i agree with you i'm not a big white album guy anyway so you know i actually like the demo when i heard that i was like oh yeah, yeah. i can get into the song yeah, yeah. It's so much of, like the White Album. So much, you know, so many of the songs. Yeah, I could like those songs, but the way it comes across in the production, the way um, they're presented, yeah. man, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and I think it's just the 
not enough input from George Martin on this record, mm. you know. Mm. Well, I, anyway, that obviously didn't happen with Abbey Road, so. Oh Thank yeah, you. you know, Martin stipulated to Paul, "Are you sure is John on board?" Oh yeah, he agrees. Uh, well, are we going to do, do it the, the way we used to make Beatles records? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yep. And thank God they did. Thank God they did, because they needed to tell the world, like, we're not going out with a whimper. We're not going to do this. We are great. We're going to show you how great we are. They climbed Everest. They climbed Everest. Yeah, wow, man. Frickin' Beatles. Leave it to the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> the band with kaleidoscope ears, as I like to call them. <laughs> All right. Well, that brings us, I assume, to the end of this conversation about Abbey Road, specifically something. I think we're good. Which means, yeah. dot, dot, yeah. dot. What do we do What's next? What's the next album? Is well, there another album after this? So I have, I have an idea. You have an idea. All right, shoot. Okay, here, here's what I think. So we've gone through, chronologically, we've gone, picked a song off of every album, right? Right. So now what we do is we go through again and pick a song off of every album chronologically of the Smashing Pumpkins oeuvre. <laughs> That ain't gonna happen. That was your idea. <laughs> I just so wanted to see the look on your face. No, 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 no. No, but seriously, what we do now is we go through the singles, right? Right. Oh, that... Because we didn't hit any of the singles or B-sides, right? So... Oh, that'd be that'd be interesting because they often ne get neglected. I love so many singles right? and they're so yeah. great. And yeah. B sides, we can you know yeah. go through them as well. You know, there's there's lots to pick from. So should we go back to the beginning and chronologically and through singles? the singles? I'd love to. That'd be awesome. What do we have? What's the first one? Is it I want? Uh, she loves. Well, the you. first one was Love Me Do, right? Oh, we're gonna I mean, do Love Me Do. Well, no, 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 no. But we can, we see, this is the thing. We can pick, we can skip over, we can do... I don't know what the B-side of Love Me Do was, though. Let me let me check oh. that as we talk. Um, That's a curious one. Debut single by the English rock band, The Beatles. Oh, yeah, P.S. I Love You, right. Oh, that's a that's that's an interesting yeah. yeah. It's got well, anyway, bit. well we'll talk about it, but I think yeah we should go chronologically through the singles. We're not going to hit every single, but we'll you know we'll pick and choose, right? Love me coming home again to you, love me, love me, do a P.S. That's a that's a great song. I think that might be our next our next. Uh, All right, yeah, maybe we'll do oh, that one. Okay. Damn. God, I hate them. <laughs> Sour grapes. <laughs> you have to be that good, actually. <laughs> anyway. They were. All right. Well, anyway, I think that's where we'll probably be going from here, at any rate. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. James, I'll see you on the... Uh, I'll see you around the block, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Absolutely. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>